Airing first on Asheville FM in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. So first up on the show, we're sharing a blast from the past, blast from the past, an interview that we conducted in 2013 via our comrades at A-Radio Berlin with a participant in the autonomous anti-capitalist street movement in Germany in the latter half of the 20th century known as Autonomen. Specifically, the guest speaks about the context of autonomous anonymous street actions during May Day of 1987 in the district of then West Berlin, known as Kreuzberg, and about the tactic that became known as the Black Block. Apologies for the audio quality on this portion. Then you'll be hearing parts of the May 2022 episode of Bad News, Angry Voices from Around the World by the A Radio Network, of which the already mentioned Berlin crew is a member, as are we. You'll hear comrades from Free Social Radio, 1431 AM in Thessaloniki, Greece, with some updates from that country. Then, friends at Chernoluknia in Ljubljana, Slovenia, will be sharing an interview with members of the Autonomous Social Center in Triste, known as Germinal, on their 10th anniversary in that space. Finally, you'll hear A Radio Vienna sharing the call-out for the 2022 June 11th Day of Solidarity with Marius Mason and all long-term anarchist prisoners. You can find more on June 11th at june11.noblogs.org, and you can find the rest of this episode of Bad News at a-radio-network.org. This week on the show, we're speaking with anonymous comrades in Germany about the political circumstances surrounding the creation of the Black Bloc tactic and the Autonomen in 1980s Berlin. This interview was recorded on May 2nd, 2013 by our comrades at A Radio Berlin, and many thanks to all those folks who made this interview possible. Denn ihr könnt uns verprügeln und ihr könnt uns verjagen, ihr wisst ganz genau, das hat nichts zu sagen, weil wir sind im Leben auf der Spur. Und ihr, den toten Gräber nur. I'd like to say right at the beginning that I will and can only describe this complex political context from my own perspective. To the American audience, can you briefly describe the partitioning up of Germany and of Berlin after the Second World War? What parties ruled and in what places? Nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg gab es in Deutschland die Aufteilung in West- und Ostdeutschland. After World War II, uh, Germany was split into East and West Germany, corresponding to the sectors of the victorious Allied powers, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, the US and France. It was the case at the time that the German Democratic Republic, the GDR, was under Soviet control and the later Federal Republic of Germany, FRG, was controlled by the three Western powers. The capital city of the GDR was East Berlin, but the capital city of West Germany was not West Berlin, which held a special status, but rather Bonn, a small city in West Germany. It's important to know that there were border controls. There was a wall around West Berlin and there were strict border controls when you wanted or had to enter the GDR or if you were trying to get from West Berlin to the FRG, or vice versa. There were special highways for this purpose. Going in the direction of the GDR, the bureaucracy and controls were stricter. As far as political parties go, in the GDR, the Socialist Unity Party, the SED, was in power all the way until reunification, which can be understood as an annexation of the GDR by the FRG. And in the FRG, there were changing coalitions between two large bourgeois parties and one small one, which were in power in different constellations. In the 1980s, a new uh, environmentalist and kind of leftist party joined the mix, but it was fairly small. Aus welcher Stadt kommst du? What city were you from and or based out of as an activist? What brought you into activism and what sorts of activities did you participate in? Hast du dich im Allgemeinen beteiligt? 
Ich komme aus Westdeutschland, war aber seit 1980. Ich komme aus Westdeutschland, aber ich war in West-Berlin seit 1980 und war politisch aktiv in der Squatters-Movement. Aber eigentlich erst. Aber really only in den 90s, denn in den 80s war ich noch ein bisschen zu jung, um wirklich aktiv in der Squatters-Movement zu nehmen, die begann in 1980. Ich könnte auch noch das Anti-Nuklear-Movement nennen. Als Teenager war ich wirklich in, back then, to hang out in der left alternative environmentalist Szene. Die leftist Urban Guerillas, RAF in Germany, waren really wirklich in Fashion und ihr die Abbreviation everywhere. The circle A, the anarchy sign, was also somehow cool. That was kind of the ambiance of my political socialization as a teenager. I also took part in demos in West Berlin and West Germany, but not only against nuclear power and so on, but also against state visits by American presidents, or for example, the Secretary of State, Alexander Haig. What I did in everyday life was neighborhood organizing, info shops, hanging out in the Kreuzberg subculture, taking part in radical leftist campaigns, squatting. That's me. Hausbesetzungen, so viel zu mir. Kannst du uns etwas über die sogenannten Can you talk about the tendency known as autonomen in Germany? What were its guiding principles and what sort of activities fit under that title? Aktionen passten unter diesen Titel. Ich kann was dazu sagen, ab Anfang der 80er. I can say what it was like from the beginning of the 80s. Before that, that there wasn't really this concept of the autonomous anyway. Later I will say more to that though. As far as the principles go, uh, to shortly list some of the important ideas. Consensus-based decision-making, deconstructing dominance, not denying it, internationalism, act local, think global, no representative politics, but rather self-organization, starting with yourself instead of saying moralistically that we have to struggle to win this and that for the people, trust through social contact rather than through participation in an organization, rejecting and actively questioning bourgeois ways of thinking and living, building up alternatives and living for oneself instead of just saying, at some point the revolution will happen and then everything will be great. Self-determined choice of means and activism beyond legality, uh, legal, illegal, scheißegal, which means basically legal, illegal, using the experiences of 68, Opposition to organization, an anti-state position, uh, anti-nationalistic, undogmatic, and calculable. As far as the activism, we talked about it a lot at the time, and there was a consensus that non-participants should not be endangered. There were, of course, the two gray areas of Nazis and cops, though. There were also long discussions about where the border is, but the important thing was no non-participants should be harmed. Uh, some other important ideas were pushing the boundaries of the state, testing out how much leeway there was there and trying to hold on to whatever we gained, intervening in social struggles and problems, class struggles, sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, etc. Uh, we also took part in a lot of things that weren't specifically autonomous, normal demos, sitting blockades or vigils, distributing flyers, organizing events, or as a realization of our own political aspirations, creating work collectives and communes also in the countryside. The things that were specifically autonomous, which other people tended not to do, and it was rare that others did with us, and so as far as participation goes, stayed small, uh, were squatting houses, having unpermitted demonstrations, so-called Sherbin demos, where all the stores and the shop windows of companies, which were closely bound up with capitalist or state system, were destroyed, uh, banks, big chains. The whole thing was limited to the previously envisioned goals, making actions out of legal demonstrations, for example, attacking cops or spray painting on the walls during a demonstration or throwing eggs filled with paint uh, as a unified block during permanent demonstrations, clandestine acts of sabotage such as setting fire to company cars or infrastructure like electricity poles, train tracks in the case of nuclear waste transports or before Nazi demonstrations, marking or outing Nazis and political representatives, finding their meeting points and where they live and marking those places whether with paintballs or with public but unpermitted actions where things also happen during the day, so-called half-public actions where people tried to show up somewhere with a lot of people that had organized amongst themselves and to give a speech, distribute flyers, spray paint, make noise, loot, throw foul-smelling liquids, when, for example, a luxury restaurant or department store opened, hang banners, go into institutions or company headquarters or offices, all dressed up and do a bunch of bullshit, create confusion in order to raise awareness of the campaign. 
um, organizing camps for and by radical leftists, uh, for example, on the theme of anti-racism, was also very important for me. For years, uh, once in the year, there was an anti-racist camp, a so-called border camp, at which many actions occurred without permission from the pigs. Uh, beyond that, autonomous plenaries regularly or on relevant occasions. For a time, there was an autonomous plenary once a month, um, also doing press work, such as the publication Radical, which was spread across the country, although it no longer exists in the autonomous sense, as it was later overtaken by Marxist-Leninist circles, and also no longer had its former importance. There was also the Interim, a city magazine in West Berlin, and later in all of Berlin, which has been published weekly since the 1st of May in 1988. We are speaking with comrades in Berlin about the partitioning of Germany and how it affected anarchist organizing in that country. What was the significance of the border wall dividing Berlin to the autonomy, and how did that influence radical opposition to the state? Die Opposition zum Staat aus. Die Mauer war für uns in Westberlin lebende relativ normal. For those of us who lived in West Berlin, the wall was relatively normal. You didn't push up against it, especially in, in everyday life. It was not so strongly perceptible. Transit across the border was, however, very difficult. You hardly had contacts from the GDR. It was first at the end of the 80s that that changed a little bit. There were always groups that had contacts and also occasionally smuggled something over, which was important for the left and the GDR, but that was very marginal. It was first in the 1988 anti-IMF World Bank campaign, at which point there were also activities happening in East Berlin that contact really occurred. That was also because there was not so much resistance from the radical left that was visible, and this was actually the case. It wasn't just how we saw it. There was just very little organizing going on. In West Berlin, there was a specific situation that we had a special status. Throughout West Germany, you had to do military service, but the inhabitants of West Berlin were exempted from this, and people who wanted to escape from serving in the German armed forces came to West Berlin. There were many students, since there were two big universities, cheap rent, no curfew, and wages were 8% higher than the subsidies in West Berlin. Because of that, there were a ton of people who came here that tended towards being leftist. This was similar to in other university cities, but more so because of West Berlin's special status. Then there was also the situation in the houses, that is, in the occupied houses, which functioned as utopias, where a lot was developed. At the start of the 80s, there was 144 squatted houses in West Berlin, which also had to do with the fact that it wasn't the capital city, or anyway, wasn't yet. Berlin first became the capital city at the start of the 90s after the annexation of the GDR. And because of this, it was possible to have small islands within the city where a lot of organizing and alternative life became possible. Another anecdote on the situation with the wall. In May 1980, the so-called Kubat Triangle was occupied, a space that, because of its curious boundary line, wasn't controlled by either the east or west, since it officially belonged to the GDR but existed behind the wall in West Berlin. The tent town that was erected there was called the Kubat Triangle, named after Norbert Kubat, who was arrested on the morning of May 2, 1987. He was accused of disturbing the peace in the context of the 1st of May. But when his application to be released on bail was rejected, he took his own life in detention on May 26, 1987. When the West Berlin pigs finally wanted to evict the space anyway, the occupiers scrambled away over the wall and were received by the GDR border guards with coffee and cakes. And in this way, they escaped repression. Another anecdote noticed that there was a pirate radio broadcast in West Berlin, which was produced in East Berlin, and then smuggled over. Because the wall, of course, couldn't prevent a radio or TV transmission from being received in East Berlin. ...and then rübergeschmuggelt wurden, ausstrahlten. Denn die Mauer konnte natürlich nicht verhindern, dass die Radio- oder Fernsehsendungen auch in Ostberlin zu empfangen waren. Welche Ähnlichkeiten und welche Unterschiede what comparisons and differences can you find from the autonomous Marxists in Italy who predated the German movement? How do they compare to the anarchists who now use many of their tactics in the street battles? Bezug auf den Straßenkampf von den heutigen Anarchisten. Der Begriff Autonomie stammt zwar aus Italien und von der Autonomia Bewegung. The concept autonomous originated in Italy, and the Autonomia movement was first applied here in the course of the 80s. The autonomous movements existed in Italy in the 70s already. So there is this real connection then, of course, but in the everyday lives of people who referred to themselves as autonomous in the 80s and 90s, this connection wasn't really perceptible. There were connections between people, West Berliners who spent a lot of time in Italy, but only among specialists. There was no big conscious connection and also no synchronicity between struggles. For us, that was relatively unimportant. At the start of the 80s in Italy, repression became really strong again. It was first then that stuff really started happening here. 
Clearly, factually, there are nevertheless connections and also differences. There were differences, since in Italy the movement was more Marxist-oriented and concentrated on the workers' movement and factory struggles. In the FRG autonomous scene, things were more undogmatic against organization, subcultural, and the housing struggles and anti-nuclear movement were stronger. One thing we had in common was street militancy, militant actions and the rejection of established parties and unions. Kannst du uns etwas erzählen über die Repression? Can you speak about the repression by the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union Party, in West Germany of the squatters movements in the early 1980s? How would you describe those occupying houses and what repressions did they face at the hands of the cops? Did this help to build the autonomous movement? War das etwas, das die Entstehung der Autonomen beförderte? Die Repression gegen die HausbesetzerInnen Bewegung, sprich Durchsuchungen, Überwachung, Räumungen. The repression against the central squatters movement, in other words, searches, surveillance, evictions, that existed regardless of what party was in power. And that sense, the CDU wasn't much different than the SPD, the Social Democratic Party. At the regional level, there were very different interests. There were also individual deaths. For example, Klaus Jürgen Rattay died when he was driven into traffic by the pigs in the course of an eviction and was run over by a bus. That was only in individual cases, though. We didn't have to continue continuously more in deaths. Almost half of the houses were evicted within a few years. That was the case both in the squatters movement of 80-81 as well as in the 90-91 movement that occurred when much of the eastern part of the city was squatted because of unclear property relations. About half of the houses remained. A part of them are still political. Others exist in the pacified form of living projects without public spaces or major political organizations. There was definitely radicalization that occurred through repression, at least for individuals. But I wouldn't see that as a general phenomenon, especially as there were also some deterrent effects when people got beaten up, whether in evictions or on other occasions. Leute was abgekriegt haben, egal ob jetzt bei Räumungen oder bei anderen Anlässen. Der 1. Mai 1987 in Kreuzberg, Berlin. May Day of 1987 in Kreuzberg, Berlin, is noted internationally as a point in history when people fought against the state ferociously in the streets and set a tone for future May Days in Germany. Can you speak about May Day in Berlin, starting with that particular year? How did this day move from boring socialist marches to street battles? hin zu Straßenschlachten statt. Seit der Randale am 1. Mai 1987 gibt es eine große, eigenständige, revolutionäre 1. Mai-Demonstration mit jeweils ca. 10.000 Menschen. Starting with the riot on May 1, 1987, there have been large, independent, revolutionary May 1 demonstrations, which usually turn out about 10.000 people. There was only one occasion in 1994 when there was no demonstration, since in the previous year there was a conflict with a small Maoist-Stalinist group, which we had to fight against at the demonstration. Then we just abandoned it the next year. Otherwise, every year there have been demonstrations, and the participants Participation also hasn't fallen off majorly in the course of 25 years. At the beginning, the participation might have even been a little bit smaller, but now the number is consistently around 10,000, I'd say. A great self-consciousness occurred from the 1987 riot that we could also do something ourselves on May 1st, and not just always be small blocks of the official DGB demo organized by the Federation of Trade Unions. Since the danger of co-optation by parties and unions was constantly being bemoaned, this was also a good alternative. Just as an explanation, uh, the unions in Germany are more the social partners of capital, in other words, very bourgeois, established and hierarchically organized. An exception to that is the FAO, uh, the Free Workers' Union, which is organized anarcho-syndistically, but which is very small, although it's been active since the 80s. There are always still small radical blocks at the big union demonstrations on May 1st, But this revolutionary, or so-called revolutionary, first of May demonstration is more relevant. Since, for about 10 years, the Nazis have also had demonstrations on the first of May, our demonstration doesn't take place in the day, but rather more towards the evening, when we're finished with the anti-Nazi activities and blockades. These also partly take place outside of Berlin, for example, in Leipzig, which we travel to. My own assessment is that, as an effect of the later time and also a decrease in the organization of people who go to a demonstration, or especially go to the first of May demo, as well as through a continuous increase in the use of cell phones and filming, that rioting has definitely become much more difficult as a result of that. That is, the attempt to give the pigs an answer to how we are harassed in our everyday lives or have to experience more state violence at smaller demonstrations. The conditions for that have also become continuously more difficult. That is also our fault. There are less and less solidly organized autonomous groups of the sort that might have built and defended barricades on other occasions and would have agreed beforehand how to act and not have just started drunkenly throwing shit. 
That has changed. The arrests of drunken and overly curious individuals has definitely increased. That would be my own assessment. In my opinion, the demonstration still has content. Every year there is a new consideration of what should be taken as the motto, what is currently important. It is more and more organized by people, though, who have been active with the Antifa, and less so by autonomous groups. We have also pulled ourselves back from that. Partially that's because we've become weaker and the Antifa has taken over more, and partially because we were also annoyed by this approach that was always trying to be bigger, higher, faster, that is huge trucks costing many ten thousands of euro, when last year maybe we had an unpermitted demo since we thought we could also manage that. The Antifa groups are strictly against that, though. Since the opening of the wall, the demonstration also goes through East Berlin, or happens partly in the West and partly in the East. For example, now on the 1st of May, a few days ago, we went to the city center, Mitte, part of former East Berlin, although that is perhaps not so relevant anymore, rather that it is the current center of power. This year we managed with 10,000 people to make it there. Last year that was prevented by the forces of repression. That was definitely a really good success. At the beginning, when the 1st of May demonstration also wanted to go through East Berlin after the fall of the wall, there were critiques on the side of radical leftists in East Berlin and the GDR as a whole. Uh, that censored previously been state-organized 1st of May workers' demonstrations in East Berlin and the GDR, and that was seen as a sort of thorny issue, uh, since the people who lived there had no more interest in the GDR and would not initially find that so great. For that reason, at the beginning, there were a lot of questions about what route, but when dogmatic groups took part in the demonstration with Stalin and Mao flags, we as autonomous felt that was really too much. The demonstration was also organized by radical leftist groups, not just by autonomous, although we played a major role in it. The Stalinist, Maoist, Marxist-Leninist groups had their own small demonstrations 10 years ago, but they almost don't occur anymore. The 2nd of May was also always the day of unemployment, since we naturally had no desire to work. That was then expressed by us having another action or demonstration on May 2nd. That hasn't had such a big resonance for a while, though. Das drückte sich dann darin aus, dass wir auch am 2. Mai noch eine Demo oder eine Aktion machten. Das hatte aber lange nicht so eine große Resonanz. We are speaking with folks in Berlin about the various rep repressions faced by anarchists in 1980s Berlin, as well as the May Day riots of 1987 in the Kreuzberg district and the continuing tradition of May Day demos. Was waren die allgemeinen Ziele des What were the general goals of the first Black Mobs? Were they ancillary to the street protests, for instance, as protection or breakaways, or did they exist as protests on their own? Oder existierten sie als eigene Protestform? Der Begriff Black Block bzw. das Phänomen war kein selbstgewählter Begriff, sondern von Medien. The concept or phenomenon of the Black Block wasn't a self-chosen concept, but was rather used by the media when they were denouncing us and applied there as a label. Appearing militantly at demonstrations in blocks or chains was something that already existed in the 1970s at anti-nuclear demos, and there were still no autonomous labeled as such, but rather communist groups that were also actionists and militant. There were some of those, not just groups sitting around and bullshitting. The earmarks that you could already see then in the late 70s and early 80s were black leather jackets, helmets, cudgels, masks, protection on the arms and shins, only walking with people in a chain that you knew, that helped bring about a feeling of identity and strength and to deter the pigs from singling out people. So it also clearly had a functionality, and it was also an expression of the critiques that when raised against boring and unimaginative marches, that you shouldn't just appeal to the state, but express a militant position. The concept black block was first slowly adopted by us in the 90s, as it sometimes is that you eventually take up these kind of concepts. But then it looked a little bit less diverse, though. Previously, in the 70s and 80s, it was still a little bit more colorful. The group Antifa M from Göttingen, for example, played a role in that and tried to get people to take on a sort of uniform with their unified appearances and their strong militant fetishism. But of course it is also the case that there's a pressure from lots of filming, since the pigs are constantly filming. People who are standing at the edges are also constantly filming. When an action really takes place on occasion, for example a conflict with the pigs, then it's extremely dangerous to be so clearly identifiable. So for that reason, this black, that is the really black black, very unified, that is definitely different from the 80s. It was a lot more colorful then, but it also wasn't so dangerous. The goal of the Black Bloc organization is, on the one hand, a feeling of strength, but also turning the Nazis and pigs, breaking through police barriers, self-protection against singling out individuals, and creating actions during a demo, such as spray painting or attacking fences and buildings. ...and actions during the demo, sprühen, zäune and buildings. 
In den USA wurden Vorwürfe erhoben, dass es Accusations have been made that those participating in radical street protest in the United States are privileged males. What sort of people did one find behind the masks of May 1987 hinter der Vermummung zu finden waren? Auch bei uns gab es natürlich Diskussionen innerhalb der autonomen Szene über Mackerdominanz, um männlich konnotierte Militanz, angestoßen durch Frauen, durch Feministinnen. There were discussions here too, of course, inside the autonomous scene about macho dominance, about the masculine connotations of militancy that were started by women, by feminists. There's still a lot of discussion about that when something happens, but also just in principle. This led, as far as I've heard, to feminists making their own blogs at demos in the 80s, sometimes at the front, so that we managed to be the first block in the front of radical leftist demonstrations or had our own demonstrations, some of which were militant, sometimes with property destructions or actions by women only or, or later lesbians that led to squatting, squats that were run only by women. At this point, I should probably say that masculine and feminine gender roles are, of course, very deep inside of us. We don't want to deny that at all. But a collective strength develops through group discussion, through a group feeling, so that in the context of organized militancy, in our public appearances, these gender roles, which are decisive in relation to militancy, since women don't learn to go into the first row and throw stones and defend themselves against police brutality, through mixed but also gender-separated discussions, it was always definitely possible to break through that. On the one hand, to find new forms of action, on the other, to take part in existing ones without following the social conventions were given that men take over the job of being strong and throwing things. Sometimes we could get really entirely beyond that. This is a discussion which is hardly new these days, but as far as realizing these ideas in our own forms of action and organization, I would say things have really declined, and my perception that was a lot stronger in the 80s. But just to say in general, once more, we're a mirror of the movement. We come from the middle class, or young, with more men organizing in our groups. That was even stronger in the 80s than today, but that's no surprise. As far as the 1st of May 1987 goes, when the cops in Kreuzberg couldn't get into certain neighborhoods anymore, other groups took part in that as well. Some individuals took part in street fights and looting and confrontations with the police. We really broke through the limitation of militancy to autonomous. A lot of people found their courage and participated, completely normal people that had never done anything like that and probably never did again. What's kind of implied in the question with the concept of privilege, I think, is that the population of poor people here in Germany is in a large of mass that you would have to say that they're staying quiet and it's just us who are acting as their representatives. I wouldn't say that. Certainly we are privileged from our backgrounds. Most people doing radical organizing tend to come from the middle class, but there's not a large impoverished population doing nothing. Durch unsere Herkunft. Die meisten, die sich linksradikal organisieren, kommen eher aus dem Mittelstand. Aber es gibt auch keine große verarmte Bevölkerung, die nichts macht. Gab es nach deinem Dafürhalten eine große feministische Bewegung? In your recollection, was there a large feminist movement during the autonomous movement in Germany? What sorts of activities did the feminist movement participate in? And was feminism a trend within the autonomen or alongside it? Bewegung Teil der Autonomen oder existierte sie parallel dazu? Die feministische Bewegung war in jedem Fall stärker in den 80ern, als sie es heute ist. Auch stärker als in den 90ern. The feminist movement was definitely stronger in the 80s than it is today. Also stronger than it was in the 90s. In terms of the autonomists, from 1987 there was a break between mixed groups and women and lesbian groups. That was during the preparations for the IMF World Bank meetings here in West Berlin. We prepared for a long time, almost two years. And during that process there was a strong movement to organize separately, because a lot of people, relatively speaking at least, were just sick of machismo in the discussions. I'm sure you're familiar with that as well. The result was an independent organization during the IMF World Bank meetings. There were separate actions by women and lesbians, but always in arrangement with the larger organizations. There were also groups that developed out of that which existed for many years later. The women's organizations from 68 were definitely the precursors, and there was still infrastructure which could be used. And of course also consciousness, in any case, and women who came from the offshoots of those attempts of the 60s, women's groups, bookstores, or separate meeting places, or days in mixed places, that has all continued over the years, but it has weakened a lot over the last 15 years. As autonomous, we were definitely mixed until this break, and after that, not all women organized separately. I didn't, but it did shake things up pretty strongly. One point of orientation was the Red Zoras, an urban guerrilla group of women, as a separate organization of the revolutionary cells, which were mixed. There were militant women's actions about all possible themes, not just so-called classic women's themes, 
but there was also an orientation on this issue in the content of practically, for example, in militant nighttime actions by women's groups, which have definitely received it in the course of recent years or even longer. It's worth remembering uh, the Walpurgis night demonstrations on the evening before the 1st of May. Since the 70s, there were women's demonstrations, which were quite large, with several thousand people. But they got smaller and smaller until they didn't exist at all. There are still very small actions, but Walpurgis Night hasn't been just about women for a long time. Nicht mehr existieren. Ganz kleine Aktionen gibt es noch. Aber Walpurgis Nacht ist schon lange kein reines Frauenthema mehr. Damals war Deutschland Ziel einer starken türkischen At the time, Germany was a destination for huge numbers of Turkish immigrants. Can you talk about the problems they faced and what relation the immigrants had with the autonomous and squatters movements? Welche Beziehung die Migrantinnen zu den autonomen oder der Hausbesetzerbewegung hatten? In Kreuzberg gibt es viele auch türkische Migrantinnen. Was autonome Hausbesetzungen angeht, so gab es sehr wenig Bezug von In Kreuzberg there are a lot of immigrants also from Turkey. As far as autonomous squads go, there was very little contact from the side of the immigrants. In the beginning of the 80s there were maybe two or three projects run by immigrants. For example, I know there was a women's group with a squad for immigrants in 1980. But there was little overlap, little contact in general in the whole organization. Mostly in the Antifa, which was already important in the 80s and not just after the fall of the wall. Fascists who sometimes came to Kreuzberg and attacked people, but also state racism. But mostly it was because of organized fascists that the autonomous got together with other groups, with youth groups like Antifa Genschlik, a Turkish anti-fascist youth group. That was very productive and went on for a few years, but it wasn't very fundamental for the autonomous movement. It was more of a peripheral thing. One thing that has to be said here is that many people who came here, or whose parents came here if they were leftists, often came from Marxist-Leninist groups or Marxist-Leninist influence groups in their countries of origin, since there were often very few undogmatic or anarchist influence organizations there. Another reason for the separation could be that the rejection of the bourgeois way of living and of the family, in which the 68 movements had at least started to take from steps, is much stronger here than in immigrant families. And the male dominance in Marxist-Leninist groups is nothing new. In the German movement, it was like that in all the communist groups as well. And on our side, you could say that there was not much openness with people that didn't correspond to the same codes, with so-called informists or normals, which comes from a kind of group identity. If you reject the prevalent bourgeois life, then it's difficult to be open with people again, who obviously or seemingly go along with it. That concerns other parts of society, though, people that live more in conformity or aren't like us. It's harder to make contact because our idea of another life is not limited to just wanting another government or to organize ourselves differently, but rather includes everyday life life and our own development and our own reflection and so it is just harder to come together so completely with single issue movements or activities like antifa in the last few years in my opinion that has changed a bit that people with an anarchist orientation from southern and southeastern european countries are coming here more and so friendships are formed although always with the condition that they belong to the same subculture it's almost a requirement since most friendships get started through subcultural events and things like that maybe it's a shame but it's like that außerhalb von so einer subkulturellen Abendgestaltung oder so, was man auch schade finden kann, aber halt so ist. Ist es eigentlich korrekt, die Vergangenheit? Is it correct to use the past tense when speaking of the autonomen? Does the tendency still live and breathe? Und ist sie aktiv? Ich würde von autonomen jetzt nicht in der Vergangenheit sprechen. Wir sind auf jeden Fall weniger geworden. I would not speak of the autonomous in the past tense now. We are definitely fewer than we used to be, just as in general organizing the radical left, whatever it's called, autonomous groups or communists or anarchists. From my perspective, since the beginning of the 80s is lessened. And the level of organization, the self-description is also quite different. Organizing together and accomplishing something, implementing it, doing collective activities, that's all declined. So it's no surprise that we, as autonomous, have also decreased. But I'll add that we are still continuing. We're still active in small campaigns and can't do otherwise because so little has changed. There are still opportunities to get together and try to organize collectively with non-autonomous. And the self-identification as autonomous, as autonomous groups still exists, although it has decreased. Nur Gruppen gibt es noch, hat aber auch abgenommen. Kannst du ein wenig zu den Taktiken und Strategien? Can you talk about other tactics and strategies employed by the autonomous movement that have influenced movements in, for instance, the United States among anarchists? I'm thinking here the refusal to dialogue with power, the refusal to separate the means and the ends, and the struggle against representation and representatives. Und an dem Kampf gegen die Stellvertreterpolitik. 
Ich kann mir vorstellen, dass da was übergesprungen ist. So ist es sicher auch andersherum. Also Seattle... Ich kann mir vorstellen, dass einige Dinge über Es ist sicher so in die andere Richtung. 99 in Seattle war definitiv ein Punkt der Orientierung für uns hier. Oder ein Impetus für militante Summit-Aktionen, die wir hier teilnehmen haben. Summit-Aktionen in dem Sinne von organisieren Summit-Proteste und zu verschiedenen anderen europäischen Ländern und partizipieren in mehr oder weniger militante Aktionen mit unseren europäischen Gruppen. Seattle was an inspiration. We always thought in the US there's not much going on, not much organization, not really any militancy in the streets. And in Seattle it might have been more the bad tactics of the police that were responsible for that, but it generated a lot of excitement. I want to emphasize that. Especially since there wasn't so much going on here at the time, in the middle of the 90s. The atmosphere was under the influence of the fall of the wall and emerging or intensified nationalism, racist attacks, Nazis on the streets and so on. Vom Mauerfall und aufkommenden oder verstärkten Nationalismus, rassistischen Übergriffen, Nazis auf der Straße und so. Die Vermummung als Taktik auf der Straße. Die Nutzung von Masken als Taktik auf der Straße hat die Passage von Gesetzen um die Welt gegen Masken. In Quebec, während der Straßenproteste, zum Beispiel gegen die Austerität im letzten Jahr. Kannst du etwas über das passiert in Deutschland und was die Reaktion der autonomen Bewegung war? Wie hat die Population die Nutzung von Masken während der Manifestationen gesehen? Was war die öffentliche Sicht der Vermummung auf Demos? Zur Frage der Vermummung und allgemein zu Legalismus würde ich sagen: Die Frage der Masken und des generellen Legalismus würde ich sagen, Whoever doesn't defend themselves isn't living right. That's an expression from the 80s. And when you do defend yourself, you get a reaction from the state, from the state monopoly on violence. This is clear. To me, the question sounds a bit like, can't it possibly scare off people from participating in campaigns like the ones you do or support? And I think that's difficult because we're doing that for a lot of reasons. The orientation on the general normal population isn't actually decisive for now and shouldn't keep us from using such tactics, in my opinion. We don't want to end up being assimilated in order not to be conspicuous or to look bad. For us, that's more of a Marxist-Leninist idea from the communist groups of the 70s, and look where they ended up. To the state ban on masking up that was introduced under Helmut Kohl's government in 1985, I would say that because of it, it became more difficult to mask up, of course. It was tried again and again, as on the 1st of May last year. It's tolerated to some degree because it's not seen as being particularly important at the moment, or because the leadership has other priorities, but people still get pulled out, of course, when the cops don't want it. Other alternatives have been considered, dressing up very colorfully with sunglasses or scarves or fake noses, but then there's always the question of whether that is really achieving the same goal. Then there were the pink and silver actions, for example, where people dressed cheerleader style in silver and pink and were no less masked up for it than if they were all in black, but that didn't work very long because the cops caught on quickly that this was also a militant plot that will go through the barriers or police controls and does actions during the demonstration, and then it wasn't so functional anymore. But those were considerations which came out of the context of the mass ban and how a block can still accomplish its goals. Oder wie man als Block trotzdem die Sachen durchsetzen kann, die man möchte, entstanden sind. We've been speaking with comrades in Berlin about the relation of feminism and the Turkish immigrants within the Autonomen, tactics which have influenced anarchists in the U.S., and responses to laws against masking up within the Autonomen. Many thanks again to all the folks at A-Radio Berlin for making this interview possible. You can find more by A-Radio Berlin, including content in English and Spanish as well as the obvious German, at aradio-berlin.org. The final straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. The Anarchist. Radio Berlin. From across the pond. So it's the Anarchist Radio Berlin. With audios in English, Spanish, and German. And please, don't mention the war. You can find us at channelzeronetwork.com and aradio-berlin.org. Greetings from Free Social Radio, 1431 AM in Thessaloniki. After the evacuation of the squad in Biology School of Auth on 31st of December 2021, and while the ground floor where the squad was located remained demolished for more than four months, with bare cables hanging and the general situation being unsustainable, the rectorial authorities decided to start the restoration procedures of the new library on the first day of Easter holidays. 
riot police, security guards and various other kinds of rabbis called in the building and guarded the ground floor debris. Obviously, this did not go unanswered, with students and people in solidarity being gathered within minutes. The cops, when they saw the crowd gaining momentum, attacked them with flash tear gas rupturing in the straight shot between the crowd and beatings. Eventually, the students pushed the cops back, which did not stop them from showing up on the following days, where the reaction was the same. After the end of these operations, we faced the ground floor as a completely sterile academic cage. The response given to this renovation was clear, stating that the squad would not be easily written off. After this, on the 9th of May, the University Authority ordered its uniformed garbage to once again guard the workers of the crew, blaming the people who opposed the evacuation of the squad in biology school for the chaos that has been caused on the ground floor and in the university in general, calling them to take responsibility for their actions and announcing that because of this, some faculties will remain closed. Finally, once again, this attack was collectively responded with an immediate gathering of people outside of the squad in biology school and an intervention at the rectorate of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. The caps fired firecrackers and flashbacks this time in the inner enclosed area of the Faculty of Science in University of Thessaloniki and caused at least three injuries of students, with one of them having a ruptured eardrum and two arrests one of which was made in a very violent way. The student associations are calling for general assemblies, marches, and have even decided to occupy schools with the main demand to remove the caps from the university campus. It should be noted that the bill for a permanent presence of university police has been voted through by the parliament and they want it to be implemented on 17th of May 2022 the day before the elections of the student unions. The next segment is an interview with the anarchist group Herminal from Triest, done by Gianna Lugner. Poklicali ste črno luknjo in njeno kontrainformativno mrežo. Po pisku oddajte svoj glas. We will uh, talk with comrade from Anarchist group Germinal on the occasion of 10th anniversary of their new social autonomous center in Trieste. Yes, we are very happy in Czarna Luknia to again have the opportunity to call to Trieste. We hear that you are in a festive mood these days. We will come to this shortly. First, please, can you tell us just a little brief about history of the anarchist group Germinal? So, uh, when it was established, uh, where was it active uh, in the past, uh, about the new place, etc., etc.? Yes, certainly. Our uh, group is an old group, uh, a very old group. Uh, it, it is uh, about 70 years old and uh, uh, began to make actions and to make uh, politics analysis uh, from uh, the beginning of nine, uh, nine, uh, hundred. And so it uh, go on uh, to our days. We had uh, an old space uh, in the center of the city of uh, Turst, uh, and with uh, the old the householder of this space, uh, kick uh, us out. Uh, maybe can you explain a bit more? How did you reach a decision to get a new place? I mean, how was how did the whole process go? Uh, were you able to do it on your own, or uh, how was it? We we made a call to all anarchist movement in Italy and also in all the world, all the Europe, to to, to collect the money to, to buy a new space. And um, part of money uh, we collect uh, with this call and uh, another part of money we ask to an um, association 
in uh, Reggio Emilia called MagSafe who lend some money to project, social projects uh, or projects that uh, not commercial or solidarity project. Mm. So what impact uh, on your political work had uh, this new stability to have uh, your own social center uh, in a city like Trieste, I imagine makes a very big difference to have the stability to be able to plan uh, for the future. Now, with a new place, uh, we decided to have a place in the street and so more and more open to public or to the people who can watch what the place is. And then we open to a lot of associations. Now we are more open than before. So for me is a very good this way of make anarchism in practice. We are in the social struggles in the city, in, in all the social struggles, and also in, in Italy, We, we are in the Anarchist Federation. So we can expect that also your celebration will be very interesting, the celebration of uh, 10 years of uh, your new social space. So uh, I think we want to visit. Can you tell us something about the program we can expect these days? Yes, sure, sure. And uh, we have uh, today's uh, celebration. We will uh, make uh, uh, on uh, Friday 13th and uh, Saturday 14th. Uh, uh, in Friday, we will do uh, the presentation of our library, social library, named Umberto Tomasini, uh, that was an uh, old comrade uh, in, of a group terminal. And uh, instead, uh, Saturday, We will uh, make uh, a demo around the city zone uh, and uh, after a um, party in, the, uh, in our uh, social center and uh, all you are uh, inv invited. Uh. Uh, thank you uh, for this little uh, historical uh, briefing and thanks for the update on how the, uh, the new space um, is affecting the um, anarchist politics in the region. Okay, thank you. Uh, see you next week. Ciao. Ciao, 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 Živio, 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 svobodo, živio, 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 svoboda, po sud, po svetu, proti diktaturi kapitala, 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 živio, 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 Before we are coming to the last segment of this episode of Bad News, the call out for the 11th of June, one more song, Kronstadt with no borders, no nation. But before this, I want to say goodbye and thank you for listening to this month's episode and I hope that you enjoyed the show. If you liked it, tell your comrades and loved ones. This episode was hosted by Anarchist Radio Vienna. La desigualdad y una situación de miseria Te empujaron a probar suerte en tierra extranjera Empieza la odisea, he buscado una opción Contra vallas alambradas, mareas o ruedas de un camión Huyes del hambre o quizás de una guerra Llegaste al continente que expolía tu tierra Te diste de bruces que la Europa fortaleza De empresas racistas como Indra y sus sistemas De control de fronteras, veas a Frontex Eres un objetivo, vigila donde te escondes Eres un ilegal que intenta sobrevivir Entre redadas Racistas, palos y balas Salen de caza los maderos A llenar los centros de internamiento De extranjeros construidos Entre el aeropuerto y los juzgados Que darán permiso a Aire Europa Para llevarte deportado no bordes, no nations. Abajo en las fronteras No bordes, no nations. No, bordes, no, nations. no más vidas que se traga el mar No nations, refugees, welcome Απ' τα παράλια της Τουρκίας, ως το Αιγαίου τα νερά Πόσες ψυχές ακόμα να χαθούνε Πόσα παιδιά, πόσα εγκλήματα 
πολέμου στο βωμό τη εξουσία. Πόσου κύκλου ακόμη θα κάνει η ιστορία. Με σύνορα επενδύσει, κεφάλαια και οτρήσει. Πετρέλα και συμφέροντα γύρω από την ενέργεια. Γύρω παντού γεωπολιτικά, αρπακτικά. Στείνουνε πολέμου, βάζουν άμαχου μπροστά. Πόσε ψυχέ ακόμη θα πρέπει να χαθούνε για να σκάσουμε τη φούσκα και από μέσα τη να βγούμε από αυτήν. Την γεωπολιτική του την απάτη που γύρω από τι επενδύσει του υψώνουν βράχτη. Τα μύτια επιτίδια με ρόλο τρομοκράτη. Με στόχο την καταστολή του κάθε παναστατικού μυαλού. Σε κάθε μέρο και χώρα μου, ό,τι κι αν κάνουν δεν θα φτάσει. Η διαλυλεγγύη είναι πράξη. No borders, no nations. Αβαχώ λε φροντέρα. No borders, no nations. Κάτω τα σύνορα του. No borders, no nations. Νο μα μοιρά και σε τραγαλμάρ. No nations, refugees, welcome. Es una fosa común que los muertos que yacen pesen en la conciencia de Europa Mar lleno de historia convertido en un gran ataúd Mientras leyes persiguen a la solidaridad que arropa La popa mira tierra, la proa mar abierto Salvar vidas condenadas por un mundo desigual Apoyo mutuo, Kropot tiene lo cierto Libertad de movimiento y guerra siempre al capital No borders, no nations Abajo en las fronteras No borders, no nations Cato está sin orato No borders, no nations No más vidas que se traga el mar No nations, refugio She's welcome. Call out 2022 for the June 11th, the International Day of Solidarity with Marius Mason and all long-term anarchist prisoners. As time moves on and the seasons change, we approach once again the June 11th International Day of Solidarity with Mary's Mason and all long-term anarchist prisoners. Another year has passed and many of our dear comrades remain captives of the state, subject to its daily subjugation, isolation and brutality. June 11th is a time to stop the ever-quickening rush of our lives and remember. Remember our imprisoned comrades, Remember our own histories of revolt. Remember the flame, sometimes flickering, sometimes blazing, of anarchism. We are all potential prisoners. With June 11th, we desire to deepen our critique of prison that challenges the distinction between prisoner and supporter. For us, these differences are conditional. We, as anarchists, see ourselves as potential prisoners. Some of us have been, some of us will be. This is the basis of our solidarity, a recognition of ourselves in the plight of those in prison. The continuum of prisoner and supporter can only be seen as tenuous, if one looks to the examples of imprisoned and formerly imprisoned comrades. Marius Mason's activity with the anarchist Black Cross, Bill Dunn's liberation of an anarchist prisoner, Paul Roper's attempt at helicopter rescue of anarchist prisoners, Claudio Lavassa's actions to liberate prisoners. The connections deepen when one considers that numerous anarchist prisoners are locked up for attacks on prison, judicial and police institutions, and that others connect us to prisoner uprisings from California and Alabama to Greece and Italy. Solidarity means. We've always said that solidarity means attack, but we must recognize that slogans do not offer us a way forward in our struggles. If attack becomes confined to a restrictive set of activities, we cut ourselves off from our more expansive vision of anarchist struggle. If we move beyond more repetition of fetishized actions, what possibilities open up to us? Solidarity means attack, yes, but what else does it mean? In this vein, we'd like to offer our suggestion. Instead of doing what you always do for your June 11th, try something new. If your focus is usually on offering material aid to prisoners, take up action against some tentacle of the prison system in your town. If you are usually out in a night attacking, try doing something to directly support an anarchist prisoner. The point is not to further entrench the forced dichotomy between direct action and care work, but to challenge our ossified roles. By trying new things, we may come to recognize that the wars that separate the dedicated supporter and the dedicated saboteur were always illusory, that our imaginations are more expansive than we thought, and that we, individually and collectively, are capable of more than we give ourselves credit for. 
Central to our vision of solidarity is maintaining the lines that connect us to our companions behind bars. We should keep alive the projects, fights and movements to which they have sacrificed so much of themselves. Our connections with anarchist prisoners start from a point of commoniality, that we share a desire to directly transform the world into a liberatory and egalitarian direction. Thus, our solidarity should root itself in bringing prisoners into our projects and investing ourselves in theirs. We want released anarchists to come out into a world of vibrant debate, collaboration and action. And we want to foster that as much as possible behind prison walls as well. This can be as simple as sending news of local struggles to a prisoner or printing prisoner statements to share at events. As with any aspect of solidarity, we are limited only by our imagination and commitment. While we should support prison struggles when they happen, we should be careful not to put the burden of struggling against the prison system on prisoners alone. Those in prison, being conditions of extreme control, surveillance and restriction, are in many ways the least able to actively fight winnable battles against prison institutions. Those of us living in relative freedom have opportunities to think strategically about what actions and sides of struggle would have the most positive impact on the life of people in prison and do the most work to dismantle the prison system, as prison is inexorably connected to numerous corporate and state institutions, enemies are everywhere. Where can we win? Supporting prisoners is also a way for different struggles to converge, as the last several decades have taught us. From the Black Liberation Army to the Earth Liberation Front to Grand Jury Resisters to Anti-Police Uprising Defendants to Land and Water Protectors. All struggles for liberation will necessarily lead to state repression and imprisonment. By building up support infrastructure and culture, by making prison a less complete isolation and removal, we strengthen every aspect of challenging this society. We also find each other, learn from each other, enrich each other. Onward. The expansion of home detention and monitoring is not new, but still growing, as the prison society further invades the everyday through technological advances. Warfare too grows increasingly digital from drone strikes to hacking while government sanctioned murder continues in all its finality. We may lack details regarding anarchists struck down or imprisoned in their pursuit of freedom in ongoing struggles in Sudan, Afghanistan and Syria, still they also move our thoughts and actions. As the state persists in all its punitive perdition, killing and imprisoning, and we find common ground with those who fight in an effort to grow our power and destabilize those that seek to control us, carrying the foreign and imprisoned with us in our relationships with them and through a persistent conflict with the existent. For ideas on potential activities, check out our blog for years of archived report backs. Those looking for materials to print and share can find them at the resources page. And most importantly, a list of anarchist prisoners to write to. We eagerly await the events, actions, statements and other contributions to this year's June 11th. For Anarchy. We left out a part of the callout with updates about anarchist long-term prisoners, but not because we think it would not be important, in the contrary. But we think it's better to read this part yourself and follow the links for more information. You can find the callout and all the aforementioned stuff on the website june11.noblogs.org. If you would like to support The Final Straw, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow and share our materials online, as well as give us feedback via the links at thsr.wtf slash tree, as in link tree. To support our transcription work and wider project, you can subscribe to us via patreon.com slash tfsr. You can also buy some merch or find donation methods at tfsr.wtf slash support. There is no Sean for this week, but he's doing well. We just spoke. 
Uh, stay tuned next week for a continuation of the liturgy of names of people killed by cops in the United States during the year of 2021. This is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.